Okay, today's interview, we are talking to a uh, interesting guy. He's actually an organic chemistry teacher at Cornell University and uh, all around interesting guy that's caught my attention on Twitter. I didn't tell you before we aired though, but the way you caught my attention was because I made a funny post on Twitter and I said, um, I'll shave all my hair off if, if silver goes to $75 in 2021. And um, I don't know if you even remember, but you commented back, hell, I'll shave your hair off. And so I went, <laughs> so I clicked yeah, that on would, your- That uh, sounds like me, yeah. <laughs> so I clicked on your stuff and I've been following you for a while since then. And, you know, you're obviously a really interesting guy. You know, you're also uh, been very into, into gold. You're a gold bug. You and I were talking a bit about uranium. We'll talk a little bit about college and, and lots of interesting things. And so um, before we get in, just want to say a special shout out to our channel sponsor, which is Vizla Silver one of my favorite silver mining stocks. So thank you, Vizla. And um, make sure you hit the like button on either side. We're going to have Dave's Twitter right there down below. And uh, thanks for coming on. Uh, it's my pleasure. Yeah, it was interesting when we crossed paths. I sent you kind of a rogue character. So I said, oh, this is going to be entertaining. Yeah, so I was thinking if we do get to that 75, you can sh cut my hair off, but then you have to wear it like a wig. You have to start wearing it like a wig. Yeah, well, you have to shave my back. <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm not sure about that exchange, but uh, I don't think it's a fair trade. But let me ask you, um, you know, you, you look like you're presently in the office right now. There's been talk about canceling student loan debt has been a recent conversation. I think they want Biden to do 50,000. And he's saying he's pushing back on that, or at least he's pushing back at that theatrically, who knows for sure. What do you think about um Let's start right there. What do you think about what do you think about that conversation, and what do you think that college loan debt should be forgiven? You're a professor at Cornell. <laughs> uh, I, I'm I'm sort of torn actually because there's I see both sides. So on the the the, the cancellation side, you've got a generation that you've kind of wiped out with debt. And, and what I know is that if you come out of college and you uh, and you're toting fifty, seventy thousand dollars in debt. I know there's doctors who say that when they get out of med school, that typically just from med school they have about two hundred thousand in debt. Um, if you've got too much debt, you're you're going to be so handcuffed, you're you're not going to change the world. So if Bill Gates had finished Harvard and was in debt, neither of which was likely, but um, he he wouldn't have gone and started a small startup. He would have gone to a cubicle to pay off his debt. So I think we, we sacrifice a lot by the kids coming out way, way, way behind the eight ball. And I think it's a hard thing to measure, but I think it's very real. Um, college is still nonetheless very expensive. So somehow you got to pay for it. Uh, I think it's not fair to those who work, who worked hard to pay off college debt. So if I, you know, if, if I just paid off all my debt or my, I paid off my kids' debt or something, all of a sudden they just said, here's 50,000, all you other guys, that's politically bad optics. So I don't think you just do a swipe. Um, a very logical system would be to, uh, to somehow make it merit-based, right? Say, we'll pay off your debt if. And, and, and then, of course, you end up in a, geo -polit a political nightmare because then all of a sudden you're being accused of being you know, against some group that's not very good at performing in college. I don't know. Um, so I don't have a good answer for you. I think we've got a big conundrum. And, a, and I think we could going forward fix the problem by, um, I think loans could be based on percent of income. Uh, back in 2011, I was in Russia today with uh, Lauren Lister. That was actually one of my first big podcasts. And, I'm going, oh, this is big. It was like 350 million setup boxes globally, I was told. And so I'm going, oh boy, don't, don't choke today, Dave. And she asked me about it. And I said, look, uh, charge a percentage of income over a number of years. And 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 a, a place like MIT, the, the the percentage wouldn't be that high because you'd say, look, the average MIT grad's going to earn this much money and do really well. And once while you're going to hit a billionaire type person. And so you you're going to get a decent return from that approach by picking the length of time and the percentage of the salary and the, note and the interest rate. And, um, and uh, there are schools looking at this, but that doesn't solve the existing problem of, of a trillion and a half dollars of student debt. Uh, I don't have a good solution. I don't think it's fair to, to, to forgive it. And I don't think it's fair to, to, 
I think we have to find a way to somehow let these kids move forward. And I, I don't, I don't have a good answer. It's a terrible problem. Yeah. I'm not sure there is one, but I, uh, I would, I would like to see it's such a, it becomes such a predatory business and, you know, they tell you, you, you 100% have to go, but then they just keep jacking the prices and they don't let you get out of it. And so who's the bay who tells you you have to go. So that's the thing I start with. I, you know, I think we could, I think we could cut. I dropped out. So I would, I agree with you on that. And you've done well, haven't you? Right. Yeah. I think it helped because it helped me get going earlier, but I don't think it's for everyone. It helped me get going earlier in in entrepreneurship and in business. And that's really helped me in a lot of ways, uh, personally and and professionally, but you know, I, I definitely don't think it's for everyone. I just, I, uh, maybe I wish there was some way to, that the, the rates didn't keep going crazier and crazier. I don't want to get in trouble with my colleagues across the campus, but let's just say that uh, Cornell costs on. seventy thousand a year, and if you study the right subject, it's it's well spent. Yeah, right. If you come here and you work hard and you study the right subject, it's well spent. I, I firmly believe that. But I also believe there's people who are studying stuff here who, who it's it, you can't extinguish the loan with the, what you're studying. And, yeah. And then you, you get to the end of three years and say, oh my God, why did I study whatever that is? Yeah, so that's an important know, distinction. I'm gonna I'm gonna recover by going to law school. So law school is the big do-over, right? It's the only school where you can say anyone can go to law school. Anyone can. But that's that's a bottomless pit of that. That is a real, that's a real scam, law school, because very few people graduating law school actually end up doing law. And so uh so so I I think that uh uh students and parents have to be better consumers. So if your kids, you're sending them off to college, and you're paying a big tab, ask what they're studying. And yeah, that's an important distinction. Crap, right? Say, look, take a gap year. You know, I'm not paying 70 grand to, to, to have you go off and study, you know, uh, Indonesian uh, film, right? It's just not gonna, I'm not paying, right? Like, right. So I think we can cut the degrees in half. We measure our progress by degree counts, so that's stupid. I don't think everyone should necessarily be a scientist or STEM, but those are the ones that pay the bills. Right. So then let me ask you, I was just kind of curious on your thoughts on it since that's a trending conversation right now and you are a professor. Now, let me ask you, um, one of the things that I look at right now is I look at um, the growing political and social divide which was already bad but obviously the the the, the gaslighting really? of the news and really? the way no. the algorithms work on social media I'm... has no i yeah i didn't think you had noticed you seem yeah. like you kind of have your head in the sand I'm right so... by me i was just too busy watching football <laughs> so what's your thoughts on what's taking place right now on top of that we obviously have an incredible amount of people behind on rent behind on mortgage without jobs and that's in america i mean there's a lot of places where the economy relies entirely off of tourism and there's been these lockdowns. So we're in this kind of precarious situation. What's your assessment on uh, how you view the world right now? Well, uh, there's some serious delusion going on here. So I keep hearing Wall Street guys telling us that we're gonna come, by the way, here's my uh, bring your dog to work. (laughs) Uh, I have three labs in a Boston Terrier. He's got more personality than the labs combined. and I keep hearing about the boom we're going to have slingshotting out of this moment. I just can't fathom that to be true. I, I, I just I can't fathom what foundation this boom is going to be built off of. I was driving home the other day and there's this new, I can't remember, it looks like a catering service or something that was new about a year and a half ago. And this there was a sign that said closed, right? Of course, there's tons of things closed, but it also said bankruptcy. And it really drove home that we've destroyed vast numbers of, 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 of the middle class um, funding businesses. And, and they're not coming back. And, and eventually they will. We will get through this, right? But we also got through the Great Depression. We also got through the stagflationary 70s. But it was awful. And the idea that somehow there's pent-up demand for what? What's the pent-up demand? Okay, so are, is the pent-up demand going to get us close to where we were that's not a boom that's that's a recovery that that's 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 crawling your way out of a hole basically but there's millions of people who aren't going to go back to doing what they were doing and the question is what's going to happen there i i I don't see the boom i i just don't buy it 
So if you were, um, or maybe even some of your students or students that graduated recently, you're in your twenties, you're in your thirties. I mean, heck you could even, there's a lot of people in their forties and fifties that have lost their jobs too, but they're looking at this and there's obviously not the same employment opportunities. Maybe they are saddled with some college debt and they're kind of, you know, you you start to lose quite a bit of optimism, which, you know, is one of the other um, unfortunate consequences of what the government has has done here, essentially forcing people out of employment and locking them in their house is the emotional toll that it's and mental toll that it's taken on people. What's your advice to a 26 year old that was your student a few years ago that lost her job or you're 36 and you're trying to figure out how you climb out of this hole? Um, what's What do you think are important ways to do that either philosophically, um, uh, mentally, or tangibly in our life? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, the stats are not encouraging to the extent that, you know, before this happened, you know, people had looked at this and, and what tends to happen is that when you go through a deep, uh, deep economic problem, you get these, these young adults who in theory would have entered the workplace and then did not, or did not enter it where they really wanted to. And so the opportunities weren't there. Uh, the, the, the studies of that, those types of generations show they never quite make it up. And so that, that's the disturbing fact is that what happens is, so imagine you're an employer and you go through a, a half a decade or a decade even malaise. We could have a bad one. Um, when you start hiring again, you're gonna hire a 30 year old or a 22 year old. And the answer is you're gonna you're gonna go back to the colleges when you finally start hiring. And you're gonna start recruiting out of the colleges. There will be this young adult generation who got missed, and they maybe they got a degree in robotics, but you know after you know serving up serving up food through a drive-through window for a few years, that that degree's not worth much. And so I think they some people will get bypassed a little bit by the system. They'll reinvent themselves if they're good. They'll do what you did, right? They'll, they'll, they'll figure out a path. And in some cases, there may be a silver lining. You get booted off the path. It was kind of a treadmill, and, and you do something that maybe you really care about. My son, uh, my younger son, was really talented, and he kind of got lost a little bit. He, he, he tried some of the cubicle-like jobs. He had a business degree from Cornell. And, uh, and it didn't work. And he's a musician now, and he buys and sells violins. Oh, and he cool. buys, you know, 18th century violins that need tender, loving care. He's got a luthier who fixes them. And he's not making a fortune. He called me the other day and said he was depressed. And one of his friends who does exactly this bought a violin on spec for nine grand across the country. So it's, that's a lot of money to be dumping into a violin for which you can only see pictures of, right? And it turned out to be, it was a legitimate quarnery and, and, and it's being refurbed, it's been tested, it's been looked at by the pros. And he doesn't know what it's gonna bring, but the quarnery brings the, the top auction prices two and a half million. And, and my son was a little depressed by it. And I said, Thomas, you're, you're envious of your friend, but it shows you that there's opportunity sitting right there, right? And so maybe you won't find a quarnery, but, his favorite violin he bought for 1500 bucks at a Skinner auction. And, and, and when the gavel came down, the woman said, oh, you got a deal on that one, right? No one in the room was paying attention or something. That's a great business. I'm envious of that if it, if it goes well. Um, he plays, he's trying to be a pro. He's trying to be a professional violinist, but COVID spanked that badly. And, and then you got these, um, how, how, what's the rating of your shows at GPR or X? <laughs> uh we'll probably won't go to the x one okay okay um he uh a lot of people got their butts kicked and uh and uh and and, and the, the jerks who are making these politicized decisions are, i don't i don't know what they're doing i don't know why you shut down restaurants i just i can't fathom why you you can't let people come in i can't fathom why we don't get to make the call there's one group that I can imagine griping about it. And that is the healthcare workers who say, hey, wait, QA, uh, dude, wait a minute. We're gonna have to deal with these guys when they come get wheeled in the door. And so I'm sympathetic to healthcare, but otherwise I should be able to, some guy says, look, here's my restaurant. It's maskless, it's mask required. Here's the spacing, come, don't come, I don't care. 
Um, I think that's the rational thing to do now. It was not in the spring. The spring when we didn't know what we are doing, clamp it down, figure out what's going on, regroup, get your pulse back down to closer to normal, figure out what the story is. As the story emerged, we should have been releasing. We should have been saying, okay, kids should all be back in school. That's crazy. It's not the teachers. I believe most teachers would go back to school. It's the teachers' unions that are not sending them back to school. I think you offer the teachers, teach at home, teach at school. You, you, just let's, let's let people start making the call, right? If you want to, you know, put put your parent in a nursing home with COVID patients there, just call up Andy Cuomo and say, hey, I'd like one of your spots over there. Yeah, I think that's it. I've called quite a few times to get my grandma in one of Andy's homes. Now yeah, I know. I've got some people I know. I'd put one of his nursing home staff <laughs> if I had my one. I start with some of the Federal Reserve governors. Yeah, so I, uh, I, I'm i lucky. I moved, I moved to Southern Utah, which I don't know a single, I've never met a single person here that's lost their job. Um, nothing got shut down ever. Um, you know, every, I go to the gym every single morning. You know, we go out to a nice restaurant, sit inside. Um, and, you know, it, it's reassuring. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of other places that are, I, I just don't know what you do when this many people have not only lost their jobs, but are really far behind in debt. And on top of that, um, a lot of people, this has caused a lot of emotional um, illnesses and suicides at super high rates. And one and of we the won't know those numbers for a long time. Those numbers are going to not, that's going to take a long time to figure out what the damage was. The other thing that I think is missed, I, there's a diner in town, one of the old school ones. You, know, you, you want to eat at the diner where the average age is about 65 years old. And uh, <laughs> those, those guys know where the real greasy stuff is. And uh, and what I know is that they're still open, but I also know he burned his savings to the ground. Yeah. And so, so how many people did we take from stable to unstable, yeah. but we can't detect it yet because we yeah. only know whether the stores and restaurants are open. Right. So I think there's a vast number of people who are, who have been profoundly destabilized, therefore sort of right on the precipice waiting to be pushed by, oh, the other day, um, I was in, yesterday I was in the parking lot and I went to put it, I, I thought my dog had stepped on this gear shift or something and I put it in neutral on me and I, I lost all my gears. So this car sounded fine, but no gear, it was just all neutral. Um, let's say it's a transmission. There are people where a transmission would put them hopelessly in debt. Right. Now I can handle the transmission. I'm a lucky guy. I can handle it. It'll suck. Um, that same day I burned a hole through a chair that we just reupholstered. I'm in trouble for that one. Um, things were a bad day, but, but my bad days are first world problems. And, and a transmission to a person who's got no money left, that, that's, that's, not, that's a serious problem. So what I'm hoping, and you kind of touched on it, is you know, your son and your son's buddy, they both kind of went down the entrepreneurial avenue. And I think that they you know, we talk about gold, we talk about silver, we talk about uranium, we talk about the macro finance picture. But one of the things that I think that's missed that, you know, it's at least changed my life is um, the entrepreneurial component. It's like, you know, you get a job, you said you, you study robotics or something, but then you can't get a job. And I, my hope is that then that makes them say, you know, how can I take what I learned in my career or my degree or the thing I've done for 15 years. And even though I don't have that job anymore, how can I create a useful component to that market in an entrepreneurial endeavor? And that's kind of, um, you know, my, my hope is that, you know, this spurs an entrepreneurial component in people um, that causes some of those shifts. And it sounds like your, your son's starting to do that. And I no, think he was it's in it before COVID. Um, he's also still impoverished. <laughs> okay, so if he had student debt, I just wrote the checks, but um, he'd be in trouble. He'd be in big trouble. Um, but the bank of dad is keeping him from starving. He's got an unbelievable, he's got a thousand square foot apartment in a very nice neighborhood in Boston that's a co op for musicians and artists. That's cool. And, and and it's a beautiful apartment and it's 900 a month. 
Oh, wow, that's going, cheap. Holy friggin' moly. I can't get that in the boonies of Ithaca for 900 miles, right? I think my yeah. electricity and gas out here in cold Utah yeah. probably totals close to that. So that's helping, and he's getting checks and stuff, and that's helping. because so the bank of dad's not getting drained too badly. Um, but what, what the problem with the entrepreneurial model is, it, is that it's hard enough to be entrepreneurial when you're in good spirits. Yeah. And it's really hard to be entrepreneurial when you've gotten knocked on your ass. Yeah. And, and that's when things just don't, that's a person who's. Dave, down. let me ask you, when was the time you were biggest knocked on your ass? I had Jim Rogers, you know, the famous commodities investor on, and he was talking about a time he was suicidal in his life. And I had Lynette Zhang on yesterday. She was sharing a time when, when she couldn't find the courage to, to, to really live and wake up or do anything. And, I, I always try to address, you know, pe your best advice for these things, because I, I, you know, it can be overwhelming. Just talk, everyone knows on this bank channel, financial system screwed, you know, there's a lot of issues, but how, if someone's listening to this and they've just like, their body feels like it's like 700 pounds are dragging around and they got beaten up emotionally, as you said, have, has there been a time like this or what advice do you have or what advice would you have to somebody? Uh, you know, I'm a bad case for this because I, 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 Tony Pompliano asked me that same question. You know, wh when did you make a huge mistake that you had to learn from? And I, I couldn't come up with one besides fighting the Fed. Um, I, I never really got knocked on my ass. I kept trying to get knocked on my ass. So I, I kept making controversial plays that were unusual. Like I, I uh, you know, I was a biology major genetics concentration as an undergrad and I decided to go be an organic chemist okay well then let me ask you about being the out you're you're kind of the outsider you've been you know removed on twitter you're not well received in the academic community and it can be easy <laughs> to kind of turn in you know get afraid at that point and I think there's a lot of people afraid to do what they want to say what they they believe so how do you deal with that type of pressure then if you couldn't relate to the previous well, we should clarify the not well received. Um, there's an analogy between chemistry and music. It's interesting. You got the one hit wonders. You get the guys who, who can do one thing pretty well. But not, and then you got the ones who really can reinvent themselves. And uh, what I can tell you is if you show me a musician who's hot at, at 25, which is when I started my job at Cornell, what I can tell you is there's very few that are still doing well at 65. And that, that at some level is true in science too. You, you, the chance of getting knocked on your butt and not being able to get back up, that, I can see it in science easily. You're, you're, you're pursuing some goal and, you're, and everything you've done and all your papers and all your information is on this goal. And then all of a sudden society decides that's not an important pursuit anymore. And that happens where all of a sudden the well just dries up. If you didn't see it coming and step aside, you end up basically uh, too far down a one-way street and, and you, lose your, you lose your existence as a, as a funded scientist. And then you can become a dark person. So um, I had a couple of times where I struggled when I was young because I actually switched. After I went to grad school uh, in organic chemistry, you know, what's called organic synthesis, which is making big hairy molecules, big, big complicated molecules, right? It's... it's um, Molecular architecture. Um, I decided when I got out, um, I'd been so successful as a grad student that I, I kind of had to escape the shadow of, of my own PhD. <laughs> um, I worked for a young guy. We did something that made us famous as hell. What, what's famous? Well, famous is going to grad school and at the end of your second year, getting an unsolicited interview offer from Cornell. Right, that, 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 that's at the end of the second year of a PhD program, that's uh, virtually unheard of. And I wasn't a phenomenal student as an undergrad. So that this was surreal. And I got an unsolicited interview from Caltech. These are, this is heady stuff because we had knocked the ball out of the park. We had really done something that people said, holy moly. So my boss was two and a half years into his assistant professorship getting senior level offers at Caltech, Stanford, Harvard, and I'm two and a half years in getting offers from, you know, equivalent places as an assistant professor. This was so sort of over the top crazy. It was a shadow I kind of had to get out from underneath because if I didn't move on, I would have peaked at the ripe old age of 23 or four. 
And so I, I decided to switch into a new field. Uh, it was organic chemistry still, but outside of my comfort zone. And, uh, and that was going pretty well, but I did, I did struggle to convince the world that what I was doing was important. It turns out it was a, it was a really good decision, but it, I had to go through, it's like the guy who does a startup, you know, and has six credit cards that have been emptied out to, to do the startup. And then years later, it worked really well, but you go, yeah, but that was, that was a tough period when I had all those credit cards full of debt and I was, you know, paying bills, you know, by the day. Um, and I'm now 41 years into this job and still a funding, right? That's, that, that's, you know, that's the Stevie Wonder Madonna model. I, I don't equate myself to those, but the survivor, yeah, I don't know, Beach Boys. What do you want to, I don't know. Um, but I tried to throw myself on the floor a few times doing that. And, uh, and, and somehow uh, the decisions worked well. Um, so I've never really had to dust myself off. I guess the biggest challenge I faced, my wife has health problems and I had to wrestle with those for many, many years since I had to raise my kids and get them to school. And stuff. So I had to juggle a family and home life. Um, so when some militant feminist says, you know, you, you don't understand, I go, yeah, yeah, I do actually. Um, and my wife was like, in some sense, having a third child, I had to take her to all these doctors. We were traveling all over the country for some of her stuff, right? Went on for, it's gone on for 30 years, actually. But, so I just learned how to prioritize. So that was the hardest thing I had to deal with, but it, I never failed from it. And so that I never had to dust myself off from it. It was just kind of a bitch at times. So what do you think are the most important, when you look around right now, what's at what's occurring, you know, with, with, uh, between censorship, between very emotionally fragile uh, people, between um, the increases in unemployment and economic instability, and knowing what you know now, what do you think are the most important things to be teaching our kids? I have a six-month-old. What do you think are the most important uh, things to be teaching them and really the cornerstone of their, of their education? Um, you ought to read Jonathan Haidt's book, um, Coddling the American Mind. I, I, I recommended that to our dean of faculty, dean of students, excuse me, and said, you ought to read this. How many book recs do we all get, right? I got a stack of books by my could aim the camera at those are authors sending me the books to read. Um, and he read it and he said, this is my day. He just described what my day is as dean of students. And, uh, and so first of all, you got to let your kids do stuff. You got to let them be independent. You got to, you know, I was hitchhiking at 12. I was getting shit faced at 12. I was smoking pot at 13, doing acid by 14 or 15. Um, and, and by the time I graduated from high school, I was kind of done with that. And I went to college and I was just nothing but focused. And I joined a fraternity eventually, not at first. And, and every once in a while, I'd, you know, I do binge drinking and stuff, but, but I, most of the time I was in the library and doing stuff. And, and I think at one point in freshman year, they thought I was the hall geek. I'm going, dude, I've been through three rehab programs by now. Right? <laughs> um, but they thought I was just the geeky guy did nothing but study. And, and still college was hard to, for me because I hadn't done any study in high school. So um, my advice is don't be a wimp. Um, the characteristics of the modern generation, which are repugnant, I shouldn't be so harsh. No, please. I want, I mean, I, I, I want you well, to be yourself. Well, it's not their fault is the problem. So my generation raises kids. So the, the it may not be our fault, but I think it's our responsibility to shake ourselves right. out of it. Right. So, so there's a total lack of independence because they didn't have free time. When I got home, we'd go out, we disappear all day Saturday. There's one rule, get home for dinner. That was it. We could go anywhere. We could go raise holy hell somewhere. No one cared. Um, stuff I did, uh, you know, I'd get stink eye from my dad and then we'd have dinner, right? Um, and, and nowadays everything is an adult supervised activity. And so the kids are so now used to turning to the adult referee saying, well, what's the answer, right? Or So now when a kid has a problem, say with something I said or something in the class or something, like that, their instinct is to go to the dean. And it's like, for Christ's sake, just come to my office. Let's talk, right? You don't have to go to the dean. So I have a disclaimer at the start of every course where I said, look, I, for one point I had a no joke pledge because I got in a fight with a union and, and, and I beat them and they got mad at me and they smeared the crap out of me. And, uh, 
And I said, I, I can't make jokes anymore. These guys are not gunning for me. I got a target on my back. It's pretty big. And, um, and I said, no joke flags. First day, first day. And I said, it's a shame. I was class clown in high school. I got two things. Class clown and something. I obviously didn't care about the other thing. I can't remember what it was. But um, class clown. And, uh, and I said, I'm sorry. I can't tell jokes anymore. It's just too risky. And I was about 20 minutes in the class. I'd cracked about 12 jokes already. I said, okay, T.O., yeah, that's not going to work. Uh, here's the deal. I said, if I say something to offend you, I apologize. I, I don't mean any harm to anybody. You could go complain to my chair. He doesn't care. He'll pretend he cares. You could, and he's a friend of mine, so <laughs> good luck with that. Um, you can go to the dean. Your complaint will go on a big staff. I said, I said, alternatively, you could come to my office, and we could chat about it. Maybe we'll both come out better for it, right? That seems to disarm them. That, that seems to convey the message. This year, because you said I'm not very popular in the academia, um, academically, I'm, I'm, I think I'm pretty successful, but um, you know, rate my professor.com. There's no negative comments oh, right. as, of, as of this year. Over 15 years, there's none. Um, some, 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 someone said he's so, he's so uh, indiscreet or something, he's hilarious, right? That's as bad as it gets, right? Hmm. Um, but then in, in, um, in, I think it was June, I got canceled, got my ass canceled off by 5,000 people signing a petition to get me fired because they, because they thought they knew me, right? They thought they knew me. And uh, I had defended the cops who pushed the old man in Buffalo. And I said, look, that's not police brutality. Um, I was about to go on QTR's podcast. And uh, I said, I, I got to take the other side. He said, ah, this is off. I said, I got to take the other side. What was the old man doing there? Why was he in a war zone? You know, I, it, it's his own fault. He, he shouldn't have been there. He's feeble. It was self-inflicted. And, and they tore me a new one. And so it felt like a hurricane going overhead. It really, it was, it was truly extraordinary. I was in conversations with trustees who were, who, who had my back. The students didn't know this. They don't, they don't know that all the things that I do for the university. There's a whole bunch of stuff I've done for the university that was kind of like covert activity. When I beat the unions twice, um, it's fully sanctioned by the provost, right? So they're smearing me on stuff I did for the union fight. When the provost calls me and says, Dave, you got to organize a counterattack, right? That they don't know that I was the enforcer for the hockey team for Christ's sake, right? And then I was on speed dial with Cornell Council the whole way. And so they smeared because I invaded their union process. I was fighting for Cornell officially, but unofficially, right? No email trail, no nothing. Um, so they smeared me for that. And then they dug that back up and they, they, they it was unpleasant as hell this spring. Uh, so in classes, I'm going to make one really politically charged statement this semester. I, I occasionally, I made, I use the term bigly, right? Bigly, that, that's, that's politics for me in class. But I said, cancel culture is repugnant. It is despicable. I, I, I actually have two classes because I didn't teach last semester. And I said, it's despicable. I said, every generation fights the man. I get it. And, and I said, They'll oppose the Vietnam War, they'll occupy Wall Street, do whatever. They're fighting institutions, they're fighting, uh, they're fighting ideas. That's your job at your age. I said, cancel culture is about destroying people. And you're trying to destroy people. I said, stop. I said, don't do it. If your friends do it, tell them to stop. It's evil. Stop. And I was impassioned because I got my ass kicked. And, you know, so I was talking to one of the trustees. He says, Dave, Dave. If you don't fight this to the death, no one can, right? And that actually lifted me up. That actually helped me. And, um, you know, and I was in conversations with a friend of mine who's been really supportive for years, uh, David Einhorn, I'm sure you know him. Um, and, and he was really supportive and he was really saying, no, this, is, this should not be a problem with, uh, I, you know, let me know if you have any more trouble, right? That sort of thing. So he had my back. And, um, so, so this generation's got to stop attacking people because someone disagrees with you doesn't mean that you should take away their livelihood and destroy their life and make them cower off. You know, I, I slept with a loaded shotgun for a couple of months during this period, and I would have used it, right? If someone had shown up at my house, I would have blown their goddamn heads right off. 
because I was I was not going to the light alone. And uh, and so it wasn't pleasant. The death threats weren't pleasant. Although when I wrote about it, I said, yeah, I get more death threats for leaving the toilet seat up. So um, so um, but but I was chatting by email with a guy at UNC uh, about him getting canceled. And the next day he killed himself. So apparently I should not, not man a crisis desk, right? That is not my calling. Because yeah. that Go ahead, his please. blood is on their hands. So so that sucks bad. And it's by the way, it's it's into the adult world. It's not just colleges, it's everywhere. And 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 it should be opposed with right down to your five. You should stand up to it. You should stand, you should, they stop. The, the guy who, who owned most of Red Bull. They started, you know, the activists in Red Bull started acting up. You fired them all. That's what I do. Now, good suggestions are different than acting up. He just fired them, but I'd clean house. If I saw a tumor growing, I'd excise that tumor fast. I, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, that's not legal. I'll fight it in court. Fire them. Yeah, it's something that, um, yeah, I've got a six month old and I, I'm really starting to think at least about getting second residence outside of America. I'm unsure if I want my daughter to grow up here. I don't see how it's going to stop. And I also the 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 effect that what's happened on 2020, I think on not only on on children, but on the way children are brought up in this world. Um, in, in specifically in these dominant Western countries, that concerns me as well. I'm concerned that um, everyone, like the majority of my daughter's friends when she's 14 years old, the whole family dynamic, the kids, the school, it's um, going to do more harm than good. And so- You can undo that yourself. Well, that's my plan. I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm someone that's, I'm very. I'm minimal. not that pessimistic. I think it's a risk. You know, this guy. Do you think it's going to stop then? At some point it'll burn itself out. I think uh, for one thing, the next generation will come along and say, these guys are assholes, right? I, it, that's what happens. Uh, the next generation will say they will not imitate their predecessors. Um, I can't say that's positive. So I, I have on a number of podcasts said that we are potentially seeing the very beginnings of, of a civil war. I don't so know. So let me I, ask you, what does that look like though? I heard you say that, but what does that actually I, look I like? I don't know. So it's not like there's a Mason Dixon line. Right. It's not like there's a slavery, no slavery, you know, clear, clear division in the country. And so I don't know. One could argue it, we're already fighting, right? One could argue that, you, that there's already bloodshed. Um, and, and it's, but I, I think this too shall pass, although it's conceivable that, that the combination of social media, I, I also think, by the way, uh, I, I realize I'm almost pathologically willing to consider alternatives. It's, a, it's almost a problem. And I also, um, I'm, I'm very quick to disbelieve stuff. So the field I studied for 40 years, um, nothing turned out to be correct that we studied. There was sort of, they thought they had this idea how it works and it just it was obliterated when we actually dug in and go, that's not even close to right. What were you thinking, right? And uh, so it makes me, it, get, it, it gives me this rare ability which just, just from this experience to be able to look at it, a dozen experts, 12 Federal Reserve governors saying, we need to lower interest rates to go, you guys are all wrong. There's very, very few people who could, could could resist deferring to experts. And I don't know banking like they do, but I look at them, I go, I still think they're idiots. And I still think, and the way you know it is because history shows the path they're on has never worked. And if you read history, you go, well, these idiots think they're going to do it right this time. That's like, oh, we'll get socialism right this time. No, you won't. There's no evidence you're going to get it right this time. So James Lindsay, of, uh, who's famous in the podcast world, and he wrote a book, Cynical Theories. And he's very, he's a math PhD who, who is an expert on critical race theory and all this new era um, political movement. And he really is an expert at it. He, he's, a, he's read all Foucault, Foucault and all these guys. He's read them all. And, uh, and he says, you know, he says, we, 
we have the seeds of, of, a, of a revolution. We have the seeds of a, of a murderous revolution. It says, but it, it's like an oak tree, right? You got an oak tree, you got acorns. So those acorns are not oak trees, they're just seeds. He said, and most of them will never become oak trees. But if you got the acorn and it's a dangerous acorn, should you plant it and water it and fertilize it? No. And so he's saying we should respect the risk of this, this beginning of a, of a murderous revolution. It sure looks like, you know, Russian Revolution, you know, Germany, 1930s, um, uh, uh, cultural revolution, China, right? Is this, is this the next revolution 4.0? Is this... Uh, and, and everyone says, oh, no, we're Americans. We would never do that. I go, that's a foolish way to look at it. That, that you know, Germany was a highly civilized world, and it turned out to do things that were anything but civilized. And so uh, somehow we should respect how easy it is to march down that, that bad path. And I think we're right on it. And two things terrify me. One is that the people taking us down that path, the possibility they don't understand what terrifies me more is that they do understand. Yeah, definitely. Um, and that's I why- I wouldn't prepare to move out of the country if I were you. I, my, my bug out, I know Wall Street guys who have their private jets fueled up and they have their plan. One phone call, this, this, I was talking to Grant Williams one day and he said, he's sitting at a table with a bunch of head fermenters. He said, every last one of them has a bug out plan. Now these are the rich guys. I said, well, what is a bug out plan? He says, you make the call, sets everything into motion, you drive to the airport, you get on your plane, you fly off shore. And he says, every one of them has one of those. I was talking to Bill Fleckenstein by email and, and Bill said, yeah, but where do you go? Right, so my bug out plan is slightly more moderate. Um, if I was uber wealthy, maybe it wouldn't be. And that is, I'm sort of pondering around where in the country it would just be a decent place to live. You're in Utah. Now, in Ithaca, in principle, it would also be true, except for I'm in sort of a biosphere of liberalism. Yeah. If, if Ithaca ever went violent, I would be at risk. So if, if a militant group, did, Ventifa decided we're going to take Ithaca to the cleaners now, I would be at risk. Yeah. So, but then there's also other components, like if, if, inflation gets out of hand and that's a problem and then people because there's other components that cause these types of major historical unrest that's and it right. often doesn't have to do politically it's it's the economic component in the in the devaluation of currency so if if these things go the way you're saying you're at least considering the possibility of it what is your what is your plan i mean is it you're considering maybe just getting a second house that's more rural that has some type of food storage. And I know you got to go to, you said you had an hour, we're, we're, uh, we're approaching that, but give me okay. a, give me an idea of the ways that you think this through. Okay. If you're someone that's suggesting, Hey, civil war is a possibility. I have to imagine you've, you've at least considered through the best ways to prepare yourself. Even if that doesn't happen, if there's further instability socially and with currencies, um, what are your plans? Well, uh, the, the core of the plan, I have a lot of gold. The core of the plan is critically dependent on age. You and I are in very different worlds. Um, my world, I'm 65. I could retire today using, a, using um, uh, sort of an actuarial model that's not crazy, right? So when they talk about, you know, assume you're gonna get an 8% return, that is not my assumption. Um, I could retire today. If I can tie inflation, I'll be fine. And uh, which doesn't look that easy for me, actually. Um, and and my, my thought is more about if, if I really had to bug out, I said I would be asking the question. I am thinking about it. Where in the country would you just I can imagine going to some place and just getting a hotel and then buying a cabin on the lake that's heated and just saying, okay, we're gonna live up there. And so let's say there's a political divide. I'd make sure someplace where let's have a, a right winger 
um, which would be true. Um, <laughs> I'd find some place where, you know, there, the, the density of left wing is, is very low. So, okay. So then what to... happens? So then the reason I'm considering a possibility out of the country, and I, I don't want to get into the whole, everything I've researched and broken down on my options and how I've ranked them and stuff. But then let's say that there really is a move towards more of this type of uh, fascist kind of one world technocratic yeah. movement and then they're using technology or AI to start to more Practice. closely track the dissenters in the country. I'm old enough where I'm just going to say, I hope that <laughs> you'll just die before that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, nice, I'll, I'll down 30 Valium and go to the wall. <laughs> Dude, that is such good advice on it. On it. Well, uh, you know, but I've, you know, I, it's, it's not like I haven't made it around the bases a few times. It's not like I haven't seen what I want to see. And, if there's some place in the dynasty, I already would have seen it. And, wow, and so, crazy. you know, and they say, you know, 70 is the new 60. Those people are not looking at cognition. 70 is the new 70. And your, your brain goes, so I'm sitting there and I think all day long. I think all day long. I'm, you know, I'm at the computer. I'm thinking about economics. I'm thinking about politics. I'm thinking about chemistry. Nothing about my day. My brain is still turning to mush. And so the gist is that... Um, the gist is, is that, that, that what I'm not dying to retire to go do some. I don't have that urge. I, you know, I'll just keep reading and thinking and doing. But, um, but I, I don't, I don't have this, uh, this thought that I'd miss out on everything. So I just, I'll just cross my fingers. What I don't want to do is suffer. Right. So if I was suffering, I say, ah, screw that. I am so out of here. Right. It's, you know, death and stupidity are the same. Everybody but you suffers, right? So if you're deaf, dead or you're stupid, everyone around you suffering, not you. So um, for everyone listening, we'll have Dave back on. Leave your comments and questions down below. We went well over an hour today. So for everyone, if you want to follow the man while he's still on Twitter, for a little bit while longer, maybe <laughs> his, he <laughs> his link is right there down below uh, to check that out. Please hit the like button on the right side, right over there, the left side, right over there to send this out to more people. And uh, thanks for coming on, Dave. You betcha. Send me the link when you got it. All right, deal.